Welcome to the Graduate Institute in Conversation with podcast series. I'm Lena Menge, Outreach Officer at the Graduate Institute. In this series, we ask renowned experts and thought leaders to address pressing global issues with a Graduate Institute faculty member. This episode features a discussion with Ellen Clark, former Minister of New Zealand and former Administrator of the United Nations Development Programme, and Mohamed Mahmoud Mohamedou, Professor of International History at the Graduate Institute Geneva. The so-called war on drugs has led to devastating consequences. According to Ellen Clark, it is time to rethink the drug policy's rational and anchor it in science and evidence. In this sense, the Global Commission on Drug Policy believes policy on drugs should be health and human rights-based, and people who use drugs should not be criminalized. Hello, my name is Mohamed Mahmoud Wal Mohamedou. I'm a professor of international history at the Graduate Institute of International and Development Studies in Geneva. I am very happy to welcome today Mrs. Helen Clark. Mrs. Clark is the former Prime Minister of New Zealand and the United Nations Development Program Administrator. Uh, she's also a leader in sustainable development and gender equality and a member of the Global Commission on Drug Policy. Hello, Mrs. Clark. Hi there. It's very uh, nice to have you with us and addressing this topic, which is very much in the news today uh, in a number of countries, but also on the global level. This question of, of drug policy uh, writ large remains a bit of a, a, a gnawing issue in many places, uh, there seems to be no clear um, sort of consensus on how best or more effectively to, to pursue different uh, approaches, certainly because of different philosophies behind that. Uh, but there is nonetheless um, a sense that we, we should at this stage, given everything that's been done, the research available, the, the different efforts on the part of government, civil society, think tanks, we should be in a place where we are uh, more sort of better informed and smarter about this. What would you say is sort of the, the direction to go today on this uh, question of uh, drug policy? At the Global Commission on Drug Policy, we take the view that prohibition is the problem. And unfortunately, for decades now, a prohibitionist approach to so many drugs has been mandated by the international conventions dealing with drugs. So they create uh, problems. They mandate uh, the so-called war on drugs, which in a number of countries has, has led to devastating consequences. If you take uh, Mexico, when the, quote, war on drugs was stepped up, uh, militarized, if you like, uh, you had so many uh, displaced people, uh, disappeared people, homicide rate going uh, through the roof, uh, literally. So we say, let's stand back from that and think about what uh, rational uh, drug policies based on science and evidence might look like. And then we draw on the experience of our different members, uh, like a former uh, president of the Swiss Confederation, Ruth Dreyfus, who preceded me as chair at the Global Commission, and, and of countries which have experimented with different approaches to drugs to see what works. Uh, we believe that policies on drugs should be health and human rights based and that people who use drugs uh, should not be uh, criminalized. So there's a, a big international agenda that we have at the, at the Global Commission, but we are encouraged by the number of jurisdictions now which we see moving in a reform direction. Right. This militarized um, approach, which has a long history um, around the world, uh, it goes back to the early 70s, uh, at least in the United States, for instance, with the Nixon administration introducing that paradigm, which, which indeed has been quite unfortunately successful in many places, leading to the results you point out. Um, this particular paradigm, are we seeing any sort of um, evidence um, of it? being displaced by this health-based approach. The commission in which you're involved and Mrs. Dreyfus and, and, and many other leaders um, is certainly pushing uh, in that direction. But um, are there any indications that the merit of this approach is now uh, being seen by a larger set of actors in civil society and amongst other uh, leaders around the world? 
Certainly in civil society, which is active on these issues, uh, there's an enormous amount of support for the countries which have tried different approaches. And there's a whole range of those different approaches. But if you take, for example, uh, the problem that Portugal was faced with in the late 90s of having the highest rate uh, per capita of deaths from uh, drug-related issues, When Portugal decided to abandon uh, trying to enforce a prohibition and move to a health-based approach, uh, it got spectacular results and it led to Portugal becoming the country with the lowest rate of drug use-related deaths in Western Europe. So we know these things work. We know that what Madame Dreyfus did in her time as health minister in in Switzerland, and, and which has endured, worked. She was faced with the horror of what was called Needle Park in Zurich, where people were uh, injecting drugs in very unsafe conditions, and the HIV transmission uh, rate was soaring. Uh, She decided it was better to bring people into safe consumption spaces and provide for them to consume under uh, supervision uh, with clean needles and to preserve life at all costs. So really, uh, Portugal under now Secretary General Antonio Guterres, uh, Switzerland under uh, President of the the Swiss Council, uh, Ruth Dreyfus, they've been pioneers and and many others have followed uh, these kinds of initiatives. I should also mention that we have um, with the Commission on West Africa, which was set up by the late Kofi Annan, the same conversation took place uh, a few years back and the same efforts. Uh, were pursued, essentially based, as you were saying, on a reflection about available evidence and and scientific methods. But there's also an ethical uh, dimension to this, clearly, uh, as a matter of of choice for democratic and open societies. Let me turn now maybe to the question of um, the question of the uh, referendum on cannabis, which will be taking place in uh, New Zealand but it also raises a question, uh, a much larger question of, of that particular type of drugs uh, in relation to the policy we were discussing. If we start looking at this question, and for instance, one of the main points that is often raised is the question of what harm really are we looking at in terms of, of the users and, and more generally in terms of the populations uh, affected societally, uh, is cannabis harmful? It's significantly less harmful to those who use it than either tobacco or alcohol. Around 30 years ago in New Zealand, I was Minister of Health, and I took the first comprehensive smoke-free legislation through our parliament. Tobacco, of course, is a legal drug, as is alcohol, and the approach to them has been not to try to ban them and prohibit use, Uh, but to work on effective harm reduction strategies. And that's been very successful in my country with tobacco. But with uh, cannabis sitting out there as an illegal drug, it's quite difficult uh, to address effectively that smallish proportion of people who consume it who will have problematic use, whether it's the the ones in their young or or mid-teens who shouldn't be using it, like they shouldn't be smoking tobacco or drinking either. Uh, So uh, my view is that if we bring cannabis in from the cold, uh, treat it as a legal drug to be regulated uh, for health reasons, as we do with uh, tobacco and alcohol, we will get better results for the small proportion of those who use it where the use is problematic. Would you say, therefore, that the sort of the, the fundamental philosophy underwriting this approach is one of literacy on the one side, as you were saying, what exactly is the magnitude of the problem, but also one of of education, of uh, accompanying uh, the users and and trying to essentially move away from this logic that it causes harm uh, systematically when there's different ways to address the the impact. For instance, the question of of mental health sometimes is, is raised. This is correct. You know, my country, New Zealand, is sometimes called the the cannabis capital of the world. It's very easy to grow cannabis here, and it is very widely consumed. Uh, It's estimated that uh, New Zealanders in their lifetime, 80% of them will try cannabis. Uh, 
very, very widely available. And so when we go to a referendum like the one that's underway at the moment, the question is not do you think cannabis should be available because cannabis is extremely widely available. The question is about the terms on which it should be available. Do we keep it in an illegal market, waste an enormous amount of taxpayers' money on police trying to enforce a prohibition, uh, or do we, as I said, bring it in from the cold, regulate it, and also realize the economic benefits from taxing it, which currently largely go to organized crime, which controls supply? So there's reasons on a whole lot of levels for wanting to move in the full legalization and regulation uh, direction. Your um, foundation, the Helen Clark Foundation, which you preside, recently published a, a, a very interesting and very well-documented report entitled The Case for Yes in the 2020 Referendum on Cannabis. Um, and I was struck by precisely these, um, these arguments and the research that actually under uh, girds them, which is that this notion of um, bringing it from the coal, from the shadows, as you said, uh, is actually something that uh, is widely missing from the other approaches in this, which are based on a, on a punishing. We spoke earlier of militarizing and criminalizing systemically and systematically, as opposed to an understanding which will seek to regulate this and, and therefore be sort of a uh, anchored um, in transparent and visible processes, which can be then controlled by a variety of, of uh, policy actors, uh, and also have this uh, education aspect, which I think is, is particularly important. One of the questions, therefore, that sometimes is, is, is raised is the related question of whether such an increase in, in, in consumption through this new regulation um, rather, through this legal, uh, legalization, would would uh, lead to an increase in uh, in consumption. Uh, is that really um, so straightforward uh, as such? And and what would be the ways to sort of um, circumvent that by simply being an opportunity for those that are using it to have you know a, a better and an easier way to have access to it? By and large, legalization uh, gives those who already choose to use it. Uh, the knowledge that if they do, they're not going to end up in a court being prosecuted and possibly leaving with a criminal conviction. Uh, so that is a, a big plus uh, in itself. Uh, as well, uh, if we legalize, we do realize these significant economic benefits, the half a billion dollars or so forecast in tax revenue, uh, people who are growing cannabis, earning a legal living, not living in the shadows, we, we bring it all out in the open. And then we can deal with the, the pros and cons for people who are thinking about using it. On the basis of what we've seen in, for example, North America, uh, in the states of the USA, the capital territory, and then in Canada, of moving to full legalization, is that you don't see a sustained surge in use. Most people who want to use it are using it now, but, but in conditions of fear. It, it, there's been some evidence in some places that the teenage use actually goes down because it's, it's presumably no longer seen as cool because it's, it's legal. And sometimes the usage goes up a little bit in older age groups as people work out that uh, a product with high CBD, for example, may be quite helpful in, in calming anxiety or for the range of other uh, therapeutic reasons. Uh, we find in New Zealand that where uh, therapeutic cannabis has been legalized, it's hard to find doctors who will prescribe it and the product is quite expensive. So the likelihood is that with legal markets and licensed retailers selling products, there will be people who will look for off-the-shelf products in a bit the same way as we might go to the local pharmacy for, for a, a, a cough lolly or lozenge now. Right. Um, and, and I want to go back a little bit later on to uh, the actors that would sort of uh, be involved in such uh, new regulation from the medical field to the officials to see how this could work better. But since, since you raised this important and, and central aspect of, of the youth, I wanted maybe to ask you a little bit more on this. What about um, the parents of these youth? Um, 
are the concerns that we hear them sometimes voicing are they valid are they are they well informed because i think that sometimes they can carry some um cliches about this and and be misinformed as it were what what are your views on that the truth is that in new zealand the vast majority of parents will have tried this at some time in their lives so they know that for the most part uh, it, it hasn't uh, done them any damage whatsoever but clearly there is an issue uh, of potential problematic use for some in their mid-teens shall we say and again i i say that no one in their mid-teens should be using this as their you know, capacities are, are still developing. So we need to be able to have upfront education about why it's, it's not appropriate uh, to use it when you're young. The New Zealand uh, legislation does provide for an age of 20, which of course is higher than for either uh, tobacco or alcohol, which is set. Is that, is that the right age? Well, I think the right age could be anywhere between 18 to 25, based on the scientific uh, evidence. I think 25 would become impossible to enforce. Uh, time will tell whether uh, 20 is impossible to enforce. 18 is the more normal age of majority uh, in New Zealand. Uh, but I think if the bill goes through, it will go th through at 20, and then you know can be looked at in the light of further evidence later on. What about the question of addiction, uh, which, as you point out, is probably a bigger issue the younger uh, these, uh, these, uh, these youth are, particularly in the early teens. And that's why I think campaigns of information uh, at, at all levels, schools, but also involving the family and the community, are crucial. Uh, but can addiction remain um, a, a steady concern or as one moves up, and sort of towards maturity, that becomes something that could be dealt with differently through, for instance, you mentioned uh, the role of, of doctors when they prescribe and then when they provide uh, different disclaimers and information. Uh, where does the question of addiction fit in this? Well, uh, I don't think it's a particularly relevant issue with cannabis. I think the issue is more that uh, when young people are in their early and mid-teens, these, these are very important years for education and for developing a good uh, work ethic with study and so on. Uh, so you really want people to be concentrating on things that are healthy and conducive to that rather than, you know, getting stoned as the colloquial language is and, and not being able to, to focus on, on what's important at that time of, of life. So you don't really want young people drifting down a path of being alienated from school and not focusing on their studies and, and, and so on. Uh, and then you, know, you do have this, this small proportion where there, there may be you know, some association with other uh, health issues. So it's, it's just not recommended to be touched at these ages. But I stress <laughs> no one recommends that tobacco or alcohol be, be touched at these ages either. Of course. And this is an important, I think, nuance because we, whenever the question of drugs is raised, the question of addiction is used reflexively. But as you point out, it's a different type of consumption, which brings a different kind of, of, of drift, as it were, uh, away from other more uplifting and positive orientations, particularly at, at that age. Let me turn now to the to the sort of the environment of these away from the youth, away from the parents, um, looking at the larger societal dimension. Since clearly, um, and and again, this report addresses this uh, in extenso. You there's the sense of regulation bringing a number of other parties, and for instance, um, a, a key component of this equation is is police officers um, and the type of uh, enforcement agencies writ large that are involved. Uh, what in your experience is uh, or reflection uh, is uh, is the role in place of these actors? Sometimes we speak a lot of uh, some sort of, of bias, whether explicit or unconscious. How, how can this be improved if that's the case? So what we see with attempts to enforce laws on cannabis uh, around the world is that the, the more marginalized and particularly young people will be picked on by police. There is systemic bias. You look at the imprisonment rate, for example, and arrest and conviction rate for young uh, Afro-Americans or young black Britons. 
we have a, a similar issue here for young indigenous people, Maori uh, New Zealanders, where the uh, arrest and conviction rate on uh, cannabis and other drug-related offences is about three times the rate of that for uh, other uh, New Zealanders. So, so there is bias, and uh, our police are conscious of it, but you know they certainly haven't uh, been acting in a way which, which overcomes it. Interestingly, last year there was an attempt to move to a kind of decriminalisation of drug use in New Zealand where police were encouraged or actually directed not to arrest and prosecute, uh, but rather to divert people to services. And the, the reality is that the rate of arrest didn't drop at all. Uh, so we, we have issues. And I think the feeling of many of us is if we could get this change in the cannabis law, uh, that will be helpful in seeing that young Maori aren't pushed down a route to further delinquency and criminalization because of a brush with the law over a drug which is not a, a significantly harmful drug, particularly compared with other legal drugs on the market. Yeah, and I think many people would agree that this um, this particular case of sort of uh, a layered kind of discrimination or or double um, aspects, such as what you were describing with this particular Maori community or actors, um, is also the case in many other places. Obviously, the case of African Americans is widely known. We have other such cases in Europe, across France and Italy and the UK and, and Germany. And I think what we end up seeing through this kind of, of blindness of the system to this dimension is that it kind of reinforces uh, the systemic bias, as, as, as you pointed out, when there could be ways to introduce sort of improvement, as we're uh, discussing, that could have a positive sort of uh, effect on other, on other aspects. Uh, and that's certainly something that this type of, uh, of reforms can, can bring. Um, what about the resources, the time that would be sort of allocated? Uh, one of the um, bureaucracy's responses, well, we need to sort of rehaul our system so profoundly that this is going to be a large undertaking. Uh, is that so? Well, it, it is quite a significant undertaking. Uh, the uh, legislation that people are voting on in the referendum in New Zealand at the moment uh, provides for a new regulatory body called the Cannabis Control Authority. And its job is going to be to set up a licensing regime for retailers. And they're given a clear direction in this draft Act of Parliament uh, that says that you don't have retail outlets near schools, near community centres, near churches. You don't concentrate them in, in poor neighbourhoods. We've been down that road with alcohol uh, disastrously. On the other hand, you don't want so few licensed outlets that people stay with the uh, organised crime uh, distributors because they couldn't access a legal product. So there's quite a lot to balance up here. Uh, they will also be judging what kinds of products should go uh, on the market beyond the, you know, the cannabis uh, leaf and flower that uh, goes into uh, people, you know, making making their their stuff to to, to smoke. But you know, w will there be what other products will there be? What will their potency be? There's lots of issues to determine here, and particularly from the police um, sort of uh, side of things. I think the the point you made earlier uh, and and just now about the implications with organized crimes should be an incentive in and of itself in, in addressing this shadow sort of dimension, uh, which can only sort of make these things uh, worse. Final question on this particular aspect. Uh, testing is a lot in the news these days. Is there, is that a, a dimension that is uh, to be, should be somehow thought of in this uh, discussion or simply, as you said, given the nature of the consumption is not so much um, a relevant uh, aspect? So there are some quite significant issues with testing in New Zealand, and I think New Zealand should be looking at other countries to see how these are overcome. The, the issue of, of workplace testing is completely out of control, and you find many employers now are testing for cannabis in people's systems. But, of course, cannabis leaves traces a lot longer than either, for example, alcohol or methamphetamine. 
And, and it's almost an incentive to people to be using a, a drug like methamphetamine rather than cannabis at the weekend because it disappears. What, what do you mean by longer effects? Uh, you mean in, on a longer time frame or deeper? No, it, it, it stays, it stays in the, the system for the blood test much longer. Uh, so, so people who use cannabis, maybe you know, smoke a joint at a party on the weekend, uh, end up being discriminated against vis-a-vis -vis those who may drink heavily at the weekend or use another drug like methamphetamine where the traces don't stay. So the challenge is uh, to have a test which tests for impairment, nothing more, nothing less, right? We don't want people who are impaired, who are under the influence of substances in a way that can cause danger driving or operating machinery or whatever. But beyond that, uh, it's my view that it is no business of an employer uh, whether or not uh, someone took cannabis at a party at the weekend. Uh, it, it's not a relevant consideration. Well, of course, I think, it, and that would be a fundamental dimension of the respect for privacy, as long as this impairment aspect that, that you raised does not get in the way of the sort of the, the performance in the workplace or the impact on other colleagues, as it were. In the last uh, couple of minutes we have, I wanted to turn sort of to the, the, the larger, back to the larger picture, but in terms of the opportunities that, that we, we could face now in, in trying to address this differently with this approach that is much more constructive and oriented towards sort of a regulated kind of, of uh, of things, as we said, uh, you spoke about the obvious benefits for the economy, and I think this is something that is often forgotten because of sort of the the, the black market aspect of this. In what sort of um, larger sense could legalization change uh, our societies? I think it will be very, very positive for the rural regions of New Zealand, where this uh, product is already very widely grown. Uh, it really appeals to me to make honest citizens out of growers because the fact that this has been an illegal activity uh, and where the source of uh, the distribution is then through organized crime, uh, those crime networks end up with a lot of influence in communities, uh, which is a bad thing. So if we can bring the growers into the legal economy – if they're selling to licensed agents and retailers, I think we've got an opportunity to actually drive organized crime uh, out uh, to a, a considerable degree, and, and that's a positive. Of course, the people who grow will be paying their taxes. The people who distribute and sell will be paying their, their taxes in a legal market. So this is all for the good. Excellent. And just a final question. Are you are you optimistic that both in New Zealand with this ongoing conversation at the global level with the commission you're involved with um, and all of the other efforts that we mentioned, civil society and the like, are we heading uh, towards uh, the right direction with these efforts or is there a bit more work that needs to be done uh, to get these uh, perspectives uh, out there and, and with uh, some results? There's a lot more conversations to be had because, you know, the world's peoples have been brainwashed for decades with the idea perpetrated by the UN conventions on drugs that drugs are evil and it somehow has almost flowed from that that the people who use drugs are evil. Well, they're not. The people who use drugs could be our children, our grandchildren, our next-door neighbour. They're not evil people. So we, we really need to reset the, the whole conversation. And, and I am shocked, really, at the extent to which uh, people who use drugs are marginalized and, and punished. I've been following a, a case study in, in Glasgow in Scotland recently where someone from civil society in desperation set up a safe consumption space in a van to try to stop people dying from overdoses. Now, technically, he's outside the law, but he's saving lives. What is more important here, a law that makes no sense or saving lives? I, I know where I fall on that uh, side of the debate. So we just need a lot more realism about what we're dealing with and to have policymakers apply a health and social policy and human rights lens to these issues. Well, many thanks. I think those are wise words, and I think um – the emphasis on uh, transparency, on efficiency, on respect uh, of rights, and, and clearly a sort of a, 
a stronger ethical perspectives on all of these questions, not to mention um, sort of staying away from the criminalizing, uh, which is so undermining over the decades, as you point out is uh, certainly an important uh, message. I wanted to thank you, uh, Mrs. Helen Clark, for the time, uh, for uh, answering our questions. Uh, It's been a pleasure having this conversation. Thanks so much. Thank you. That was Helen Clark and Mohamed Mahmoud Mohamedou discussing the legal regulation of the cannabis market in the light of the upcoming referendum in New Zealand. For more information about the Graduate Institute, please visit graduateinstitute.ch. I'm Lena Menge. Thanks for listening.